Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alexander Stern. I'm a PhD candidate here at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. And today we're going to be speaking with some really excellent, excellent alumni. I'm really looking forward to the conversation here today. Um, so the way that this format's going to work is um, I'll have each of the panelists introduce themselves, and then I'll go into some questions uh, for a period of time. And then at the end, we'll open it up to questions for everyone. So I think to start us off, uh, Alyssa, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa Melendez. It's good to be back in the Friedman community, see some familiar faces. Um, I graduated from the AFE program in 2019. Um, and when I graduated, I accepted a position with OKUSA, which is the produce arm of Equal Exchange on their avocado team. Um, so I started out as a supply chain coordinator on the avocado team, doing a lot of logistics. Um, and it's a fair trade organic food company. So the supply chain is very small. Um, we work with producers in Mexico and Peru. And um, so the supply chain is very tight working with small farmers, um, small farmer cooperatives, and um, also all the way through the logistics of trucking, warehousing, all the way to the customer base. Um, so a lot of it's the communication of the mission. Um, and now I am the avocado category manager. So a lot of my position now is on the strategy and analysis side. Um, and managing the team. And so now we're a team of four people on the avocado team. So a lot of my work now is managing the team and um, just keeping up with all of the logistics uh, and um, the strategy and analysis for every season. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, Crystal, would you like to go? Hi everyone, um, good afternoon. I'm really delighted and honored to be here today. And it's good to see um, old friends and yeah, familiar faces. So I'm Crystal and I'm um, now part of Ocean Spray Cranberries on the Regulatory Affairs team. I graduated from the AFE program as well last year. And uh, so what I do right now at Ocean Spray um, as part of regulatory affairs, basically, I, my job really focuses on ensuring that um, all our products comply with food and nutrition and other sorts of regulations, making sure that all our products uh, meet regulatory standards for use. And this involves analyzing upcoming existing regulations in relation to our company's products and um, interpreting the regulations and then distilling the implications and communicating these implications to stakeholders because um, these regulations often have legal and financial implications for the company. So a good way to think about regula the regulatory function in a food company is like a funnel because all products get funneled through the regulatory team. Um, our work touches on all different stages of the product from conceptualization to product trials and even after it gets onto market, because um, we have to make sure that the ingredients that we're using are permitted in the markets that we want to sell the products in, and at what levels um, they're actually permitted, whether they're allergens we need to watch out for, for example, and then during um, production um, trials and stuff, we need to ensure that the, everything on the label is accurate before it gets to market. And even after the product gets to market, um, regulations can change or get updated. And so we need to relook at our products and make sure that um, they're all still in compliance with the different kinds of regulations that we have to fulfill. And sometimes if we want to bring an existing product and introduce it to new markets in different countries, we also have to make sure that um, our product complies with the food regulations in various countries because they all differ you know, in various aspects and um, so we have to look out for a lot of these details. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to share more as we go along in the session today. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Okay, um, Natalie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, happy to. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie Cleaner. I'm an AFE alum from 2018. Um, thanks for having me on. I 
came into the AFE program from the nonprofit world, um, knowing that I wanted to work towards using business as a lever for influencing our food system to be more sustainable. So I took an internship during the AFE program that was as a sustainability intern at Stonyfield, which is an organic yogurt company in New Hampshire. And after graduating, I took a full-time role there in strategic sourcing, focused specifically on our co-manufacturing portfolio, which is basically purchasing finished goods that are produced off-site. So I've supported both Stonyfield as well as our parent companies, other businesses in the U.S. and Canada in um, this procurement and sourcing role. But after a few years of that, I knew I wanted to get back closer to having sustainability be more of the focus of my day-to-day work. And so back in September of last year, I took a new role as a sustainability advisor at a small consulting firm called Fair Strategies. And so um, this consulting firm helps brands and retailers build and implement sustainability programs with a focus on environmental and social progress in both their products and supply chain. And our work tends to focus on food and beverage companies. That's who I you know, have a lot of clients in those industries, but we also do a lot of work in personal care and apparel um, and some in pharmaceutical um, industry as well. So my role as a consultant is I help clients develop their sustainability strategies, you know, understanding their unique needs and their unique business models, and then also help um, build out and advance sourcing and supply chain initiatives. So a lot of my work today does focus on regenerative agriculture related projects, um, but I work on a wide, wide range of things. So happy to, you know, share more about that. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I noticed actually also uh, the panelists and I are the only people with our cameras on right now. So if you'd like to turn on your camera, you're more than welcome to. It'd be nice to see some faces so we can talk to more than just each other. Um, with that, I'd like to um, have Adriel, the last panelist, introduce himself. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm Adriel C. Flanders. Uh, I graduated in AFE in 2019 um, with Alyssa. I'm a product manager at Indigo Ag um, here in Boston. We're an agriculture technology company. Um, so in my role currently, I'm working on setting up um, a carbon marketplace based in agriculture. Um, so I work specifically um, on some of our research and development side and on building the quantification engine behind quantifying um, carbon credits across our partner farmers. Um, my background prior to Friedman was in smaller scale food and agriculture. Um, more on the organic side of things. Um, and I used the opportunity at Friedman um, to get more experience in the private sector, um, interning at Stonyfield, uh, where Natalie worked, and interning at Ceres um, in Boston also. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about any of those experiences um, in my day-to-day -day at Indigo right now. Um, I interface with a lot of people um, kind of across disciplines. Um, I manage a squad that contains a lot of agronomic scientists, data scientists, um, engineers. Um, so the work that we're doing uh, can be quantitative, but is also tied to business value um, and you know, some of our carbon car credit marketplace development. Um, so excited for this conversation, excited to be here with familiar faces. Thanks, Adriel. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into questions. I have some um, more general questions that really apply to everyone. So um, feel free to chime in as you'd like if you think that it's particularly relevant for you. Um, something that I think is pretty important and I'm sure others on the call probably think is important as well, I hope, is um, understanding how you found your position because as people are graduating and looking for jobs. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions of, uh, do we put networking before um, different listservs? H how did you go about finding your current position? Was it based on the internships you had in school? Um, yeah, so thanks. I can jump in. Um, so I found my current position through networking. Um, when I was applying to different jobs in my second year at Friedman, I tried to split my time between networking and kind of cold applying to jobs equally. Um, I ended up being connected to someone um, at Indigo through someone in my network after I'd expressed interest in a job and thought they might know someone. 
Um, I ended up getting a different job than the one that I had been interested in. Um, and that networking call kind of turned into an interview. Um, so I think it was opportunistic, um, but something that, uh, yeah, took advantage of connections through my network. Yeah, I can go next. Similar to Adriel, kind of split my time between um, having just gone through another job search process last year, um, split my time between networking and also, candidly, I've used LinkedIn a lot um, for both setting alerts for companies that I was interested in um, and using that as a like listserv. I've relied on LinkedIn for them a lot. So that's how I initially heard about this job future strategies because I had followed them as a company and so saw it when they posted the role and then also had connections there because there's another AFE person um, at the company today and um, through Stony Field, I had another connection. So that's kind of a, a mix of both. Initially heard about it through LinkedIn and then worked that networking angle from there. Um, I can go next. So for myself, I was interning at Ocean Spray um, prior to taking on a full-time role. And I knew about this internship because it was advertised through Tufts. Um, so it was through the email. Uh, there was a Tufts portal. I think we're regularly informed about jobs and internships. So I just applied through there and um, got the internship. So I interned and then Towards the end of my internship, I was offered a full-time role, which I was delighted to take on because I had gotten to know the, the people and the work and I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. I can go. Um, I would definitely say utilize your network as much as possible. I found my job uh, through the Good Food Jobs um, website. Um, and then I started asking around and actually Adriel connected me with somebody that worked there um, who was his mentor. Uh, so it ended up being a great way to connect with somebody on the team, learn more about the job. Um, and they were actually a AFE grad and also another person on the team was an AFE grad. So a lot of connections through the Friedman School. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest benefits about the program is just a network that you form and the relationships. Thanks. This is really appreciated, I'm sure, by not only myself, but also the other students as, as they're looking for positions. So um, moving on to your roles a little bit. Um, so I wonder if each of you could speak about right now in your current position, what is most rewarding and what is most challenging? Um, and maybe we'll go backwards this time and we'll, we'll start with Alyssa. Sure, um, I'll start with what is most rewarding. I think when I was looking for a job, I definitely wanted to find a company that matched with my values. Um, and I really connected with the mission of equal exchange, being organic and fair trade and just the close relationship that they had with their farmers. I knew I wanted to work directly with small farmers. Um, and I think just the transparency uh, throughout the supply chain really appealed to me. Um, but I definitely think everybody on the team takes a lot of pride in what they do every day. It's not difficult, it's not easy, um, especially working in produce. Avocados are extremely volatile. I Every single week I'm like negotiating pricing and then I don't know if you've all heard about the ban on <laughs> imports of avocados into the U.S., so that caused another strain. Um, so I think what's most challenging is just the volatility of the supply chain. Um, but I think, you know, having a good team and having some humor with it, uh, it's easier to get through. For myself, um, so just now I mentioned the funnel and so because, because our role is so cross-cutting and cross-functional, I actually get to learn a lot about how a food company works, which is very personally rewarding for me because coming out of grad school and while in grad school, I wanted to work for a food company because I really wanted to understand how food companies work and you know, understand the private sector perspective of things. So um, that really satisfies my personal curiosity and 
passion for food production. And I just love that I get to play a part in getting food to consumers. So it's this collaborative and cross-functional um, part of my work that, that's really rewarding. Um, yeah, so for me, what's what I'm finding really rewarding is that I'm getting to work with a lot of different clients and a lot of different companies um, coming from being at just one company and now being in a consulting role. I'm working with a ton of different industries. Um, each company is at their own you know, place in their sustainability journey. They have different goals and priorities, which really, you know, cause me to have to think strategically about building out solutions that are going to work specifically for them and their needs and their business. And so I think that's really um, motivating and exciting. You know, one day I'm working with an apparel company about their sourcing approaches. And the next I'm working with a pharmaceutical company who's just starting on their sustainability journey. And so I'm learning about a ton of different industries. Um, I think challenges, um, I think consulting just brings its own challenges as a field. Um, you know, being on billable time is, I think, something to think about whether that's something that you feel comfortable doing for, you know, a line of work. It's just it brings its own challenges with it, having to really focus on super pleasing clients, you know, earning that business and making sure that you can maintain that client relationship um, is rewarding in a lot of ways and also comes with challenges in some ways too. So I think that's just a little bit inherent of the, the field of consulting. It's interesting to hear some similar threads through our stories. Um, I think for me, uh, similar to what Crystal said, uh, some of the most rewarding parts of my job at Indigo right now are being in an interdisciplinary environment. Like Indigo, um, the problems that we're working on are very complex and exciting. I think like that feels very aligned with my interests um, and getting every day to work kind of with people from vastly different backgrounds, um, economic scientists, soil scientists, you know, people who are geographically dispersed. Um, that's really an exciting environment to be in. Um, one thing that I haven't been able to do since pre-pandemic is travel out to see some of our agricultural uh, partners. And I think that that's something that I find extremely rewarding um, and hope to pick up again this summer, but travel has been curtailed um, with COVID. Uh, so I think like being able to talk, we have a wide network of uh, research trials and partners that we work with are large growers um, you know, in different parts of the country. Um, so getting their input because they're our ultimate customers um, is something that I find very rewarding. On the challenging side, um, I would say Indigo is a pretty large startup, um, but it's still a startup and has undergone a lot of changes over the past, over the over two and a half years that I've been, been at Indigo. Um, and I think some of those shifts have been quite significant and have impacted kind of scope and day-to-day, -day, um, you know, day-to-day -day work. So I think those things, like I, I try to roll with the changes, but I find those challenging, um, you know, from time to time as well. So I think those have been some of the bigger challenges in my time. Um, if I can just jump in, I realize I didn't speak to the challenges. Actually, the challenges for me um, are also linked to, to um, the rewarding aspect, which is the cross-functional aspect, because we, we deal with a lot of different departments, right? Like the, we work with product development, we work with the marketing um, department, um, government affairs, and it's, it's a challenge um, can be a challenge communicating with other business functions that may have conflicting uh, interests as, as what you know the regulatory team wants to advocate and then put forth. So for example, marketing might want to um, say some things about the product and then it's regulatory's responsibility and role to tell them this is what the regulation state, this is you know, this is what we, we recommend and then really work with them to try and, and find um, alternatives that can satisfy business solutions because it's always challenging to, to tell your colleagues like, no, we, we can't do, <laughs> do this. But the challenge is in working together and finding solutions that can help move the business forward. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Thank you. Um, I should mention this. If you have a follow on after someone comments that you'd like to say, please go ahead. If this is more of a conversation, um, instead of just going around answering questions, which is fine, it, it would be nice, you know, so it's totally fine to kind of like just jump in if you want. Um, okay, 
So my next question, I wonder if each of you could describe um, particular projects. So just one project that either you're really fond of or might be very interesting that you could just give us a bit more of a view on what exactly you are doing day to day or um, if not day to day, like what it means for the company. Because if the day to day is like really mundane, even if the day to day is mundane, please share. Um, okay, uh, let's start with Adriel this time. Sure. Um, I'll talk about our soil carbon experiment. So over my entire time at Indigo, um, I've been involved in a large scale trial across around 100 um, fields nationwide. And these are like commercial scale um, trials. And as my role has shifted, uh, my involvement in it has shifted. Currently, as a product manager, um, I lead a squad of people that are helping put that together. And I think this, like this project is interesting to me because it requires kind of operational concerns like getting soil samplers out and working with growers to find the right time to go sample their fields. You know, we're taking um, like a wide range of research cores and other types of soil samples to understand the impact of regenerative practices um, over time at scale. Um, it requires kind of science, agronomic science, but also data science to understand um, kind of like what sampling design we should take um, you know, on a field scale, but also on an experimental scale. Um, you know, and requires kind of understanding of what regenerative practices we want to see. So uh, I think like we've been working with growers to implement um, these different regenerative or carbon farming practices, implementing grazing, um, working with cover crops and no-till. Um, so, you know, we get to work with our agronomic specialists on the indigo side and also with our partner growers um, to figure out kind of the right sequence of things uh, to increase profitability, increase uh, carbon sequestration rates, um, and then learn how to measure that. So I think like that combination day to day is something I'm involved with and I find rewarding. Thanks, Adriel. Um, so are you finding that some of the methods that you're using are sequestering carbon? What are the effects of this project? Or is it successful? Yeah, so I think our, we're in year two or three for most of our fields. Um, and, you know, this is a long term study, I think, as many of you probably know, you know, we're looking for like a lot of these benefits um, can shift seasonally, um, but really might not show up for multiple years. Um, we are seeing benefits. And I think like there's a lot of other research out there to corroborate that. You know, cover cropping and no-till, these carbon farming practices can increase sequestration rates. Um, so yeah, we're excited to dig more into the data, but early results are exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing the results. Would would that be something that Indigo publishes and, and or is that just more of a marketing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are multiple uses, Publish publications or blog posts or other kind of publicity are, is definitely one outcome um, that we're planning on. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, Natalie, would you like to share a project that um, you're working on and what the day-to-day -day looks like? Sure, yeah. So um, right now I'm working on a, a project with a company that has multiple major brands within their parent company. And at the parent company level, they've made a commitment to sourcing regenerative materials. So commitment to sourcing 100% regenerative materials by 2025. And so each brand has multiple materials that they're purchasing and each material has its own kind of procurement team and sustainability, or each brand has its own procurement and sustainability team um, working on it and has their own project that they're pursuing related to regenerative sourcing. Um, and each project has its own approaches and methods of measurement and verification. And so what we're being tasked with is to help this company look across all of their brands and all of their materials and all of the different individual programs and projects that they have going on to help them figure out and navigate and build out a strategy for how they can make broader claims about their regenerative sourcing strategy. Um, you know, looking at what can they start to say this year versus three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now about this approach that they're taking to sourcing both at a parent company, you know, overall level, as well as for each individual brand. And it gets quite complex because um, each one of these programs is measuring and looking at slightly different things, is defining regenerative agriculture in a slightly different way, collecting different information. Um, and so 
my day-to-day work is a lot of talking to project partners. So like Indigo would be a great example of a project partner that we might talk to to understand their process of measurement and verification of soil carbon and talking to other project partners um, like Savory EOV or other certification schemes that are out there who are trying to measure soil health and biodiversity and stop carbon and what's their approach to doing that? How are they providing that verification? Um, And so we're digging into each of these individual program partners, and then we're going to be synthesizing that all together into, okay, where are the gaps in what you're pursuing today? What tools are out there where you could fill those gaps and be able to make a robust credible and validated claim about regenerative sourcing down the line. So that's something that I'm very deep into right now. It's very connected, I think, with the types of things that Adriel is doing. And it's also really connected to the types of work that Christy is doing, because eventually we're going to be providing recommendations to their marketing and their regulatory team on what claims they can make and how those claims are backed up. And so that's going to have to go through a really intense vetting process. Um, And so it's very related to, you know, what what you guys are working on as well so that's been really interesting to and a complex one to work through thanks natalie um okay so you described that there's potentially going to be gaps when you say gaps do you mean you're going to have to reconcile the definitions of what certain brands are considering regenerative and what other ones okay so ultimately is your goal to kind of develop a way to measure the performance of regenerative ag like different variables. Yeah, like this company would be able to like to they would they would like to be able to make claims about the outcomes of their regenerative sourcing approaches, right? And say like we are sequestering carbon, we've helped improve biodiversity, we've helped improve water cycles, right? Like that's where they want to get to. And right now they're asking us how do we build out systems and how do we partner with the right people to make sure that that's actually happening in a verified way and those claims can be backed up. I think of so many ties to like what Alyssa you're doing too, in terms mm-hmm. of like, you know, fair trade or organic, like these are established ways to mm-hmm. create, like monetize some of these changes or differences in practices. And I think like that, at least is what we're focused on at Indigo is thinking about new revenue streams for farmers mm-hmm. uh, that are either already engaged in practices or who aren't yet. Yep. Totally. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting, Natalie. Um, it sounds very challenging, honestly, <laughs> and an excellent, excellent project. Um, Crystal, would you like to describe a particular project that you've been working on? Yeah, um, so I've been working on helping to bring some products to Asia later this year. And just to walk you guys through what that entails. Um, so the marketing team will have their plan and their timetable for um, products to be to be out on the market by a certain time in the year and then work back, working backwards. Basically, um, we, we work in teams and, you know, different people have different parts of the work carved out for them. And for me on regulatory side, on the regulatory side, uh, I've been working at looking at looking up nutrition regulations in these different countries that we're going to market in and making sure that um, you know, all the labels will be appropriately um, yeah, reflect all the information, like the nutrition facts panel information, the ingredient statement information, these little details that, that maybe may not seem very significant, but so much care and thought and research goes into ensuring that everything is is accurate for the particular country. For example, if we're selling it in Indonesia, they require halal certification. So that also has to be um, investigated and, and, and you know the proper certification procedures to get that certified have to, has to be done. Um, and then the calculations also differ slightly from country to country. Um, so a, a, a given product may be um, this number of calories in this country, but because other countries calculate their calories differently from proteins or from carbohydrates, <laughs> fat, you can get a slightly different, can get slightly different figures. So a lot of it is um, doing the groundwork and research and making sure we um, 
we're aware of what, everything that's out there and then reconciling and making sure that um, we're not missing out on anything that needs to be declared. And I'm, I'm very happy to be involved in this particular project because uh, we're working on bringing products to Southeast Asia, so pretty close to home for me. And uh, it's just fun knowing that I'm, I have this part to play uh, in, in bringing products on the shelves and friends and family are going to be able to buy those products. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I guess a lot of it's very detail oriented work um, it, because, you know, missing out on certain details could be costly. And yeah, so I think that's a, definitely a skill set um, that you hone on the job, but also you have to really appreciate and enjoy learning because um, different products or uh, different problems can crop up on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes customers will have questions um, which are then directed back to the regulatory team to, to answer about the products. And then you just constantly need to look for solutions and discuss um, what, what needs to be done and, and look for the appropriate regulations. Yeah. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, so when you're talking about regulations in other countries, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm only slightly familiar with looking into regulations in the US. How do you go about doing that? Um, where do you find that information? Is it just easily publicly available? Yeah, that's a great question. It really varies. Um, so the ease of, of uh, searching out this information really varies from country to country. If it's English speaking countries, that's usually much easier. Uh, so we have to deal with uh, non-English um, speaking countries in Asia as well. But thankfully there are, um, there are search kind of, I wouldn't say search engines, but they're dedicated um, agencies that provide um, regulatory um, advice and assistance, like local advice. Those can be really helpful in tapping to find obscure regulations. For example, last year I was working on a Mexican regulation that was published not online, but in the local newspaper in a certain Mexican state. So <laughs> that would have, it was, it was, would have been really difficult finding that online. Um, so yeah, this is a challenge, but there are different ways that um, we can tap on to find these regulations. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, would you like to speak about a project that you've been working on? Sure. Um, going off of, you know, finding different revenue streams, I think, one of the main goals of our program is to have a whole tree program. So avocados come in many different sizes. And a lot of the times um, when they're selling to a customer, they'll only request, you know, the middle sizes, one or two. And then they're going to have to, you know, find different outlets for the other sizes, a lot of like much larger that aren't really common in the market or super small sizes. Um, that will either end up in the national market at a really cheap price or they'll sell it to the pack houses for guacamole. So we're always trying to look for different revenue streams um, for the smaller avocados. So the smallest size we sell is an 84. So it's like it's pretty small. Um, and we're working on a packaging project right now um, to package four in a box um, and sell that to our customers uh, to create a different, you know, clientele and um, different revenue stream. And so going through that project, um, I've been able to cross collaborate with a lot of different teams, marketing team, um, the creative team at Equal Exchange. And so designing the box um, has been really fun. And uh, I've never done like a packaging project. Uh, but of course, Equal Exchange has, you know, coffee, chocolate, tea. So doing a lot of work with them to figure out what certifications we need, what do we have to have on the box itself uh, to make sure like the fair trade label is there, the organic label, um, but also information about where it was packaged, who is it being distributed by. Um, so that was a big learning process. I think <laughs> creative team probably adjusted the design five different times because we had to add more information to make sure that it was, um, you know, completely done with all of the, the certs that it needed. So um, that's been really fun um, and we're hoping to launch it next season. So 
Um, I think a lot of the farmers are really excited that they'll be able to sell more of the smaller sizes. Um, and it's definitely a big loss for them every year. So I think it'll, it'll really support the program overall. Thanks, Alyssa. Okay, so when you mentioned the sizes, I just started working specifically in the food waste realm, and it made me think, what's happening? Can you just speak a little bit about food waste, um, if this is something that you deal with a lot, or does it go directly to composting on farms? Is grading an issue? Um, I'd just love to know. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a huge problem, and I think we're trying to work with different, you know, programs like Imperfect Foods and things like that, Misfits that are, you know, supporting uglier fruit that's not, you know, up to the grade that people want at the supermarkets. Um, I'm sure everybody does this, me included, going to the supermarket, you know, you want to pick the prettiest avocado or something like that, just because it is a more expensive um, produce item. And especially for ourselves, being organic and fair trade, our quality is really important to us. Um, having a niche product, you know, them paying a premium on it. We want to make sure customers are happy, but um, we definitely try and limit that as much as possible, such as buying, you know, the whole tree as much as we can. Um, you know, there's like a distribution that we always look for, um, but we give kind of leeway between that and our sales team does an incredible job, you know, trying to convince people that like the size doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, there are different categories of, you know, defects. So there's cat one, uh, which is like the premium fruit. And then category two has like some surface level, um, defects to it. And then category three, which we actually don't buy, um, is where there's like more than, you know, 50% of the fruit has defects. Um, and that will normally go to the national market. So they'll sell it to the back house at, you know, a lower price but at least getting something for the fruit and then the rest, which, you know, category four or something like that, that fruit just can't be sold is going to compost. Thank you. Okay. So we have about 15, 20 minutes left. So I'm going to switch over to some questions. I wonder, I didn't mention this, um, that people could put their questions in the chat. If you put your question in the chat, I'm happy to read it. Um, if not, and you'd just like to ask your question, go ahead and raise your hand and I will call on you. Let me see, okay. Just wondering, okay, so this is a question on job searching. So searching for jobs positions, which sectors did you find most relevant to our general field of studies besides the food industry? That was kind of a shift for me when I was applying to jobs, actually. You know, I was focused at Friedman mostly on like corporate social responsibility, um, corporate sustainability programs, kind of like, uh, like Stony and Field, where I had interned, um, and hadn't thought too much about startups. Um, and I think like Indigo at the time, I was familiar with um, from their work out of biotech here, working on microbial seed coatings. Um, but it was only through networking with someone there that I found out that they were really looking at um, setting up a carbon sequestration, carbon credit marketplace program. Um, so I think like being more, you know, if I'd been more open to different types of startups in that world, um, I think that would be another relevant um, field where there are potentially more roles. Um, I think for me, that's at Indigo, a lot of people are working on this carbon program. Um, whereas that many, you know, even mission driven food companies, there are only a few people working on the sustainability team. Uh, so in terms of number of jobs, that's something I would consider. Uh, I would also mention there's a lot of kind of the big nonprofits that you've all probably heard of and are very well aware of that are doing a ton of work that's really relevant to um, AFE. So, you know, EDF, World Wildlife Fund, World Resources Institute, I mean, all those are great ones to check out. They have specific food teams, they have teams working on water, they have teams working on carbon, they have just a ton of really great efforts um, related to AFE, and then also, you know, series, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that, if you're interested in, um, you know, the corporate side of things, series is doing a lot of really neat work too, um, and it's, I think, growing really fast, um, and then also from the kind of consulting world, there's a number of really interesting consulting firms that um, there's just a growing interest from companies and organizations 
on sustainable food systems and sustainable agriculture. And so like Qantas is a nearby one that does a lot around LCAs and modeling and huge presence in, um, in the food you know, realm. So that could be another area to look into. I would just add, yeah, some of the ideas to look out for be consulting, as Natalie mentioned, and also maybe the food service industry, because it's not a the food producer, but it leverages the purchasing power, right, to make change, to uh, make changes across the food system. Yeah. I know I'm not a panelist, but I have to chime in on this one. Um, also working for the federal government, I just started a fellowship at EPA and it's been wonderful. USDA um, would be an excellent place to work. I feel like our education is primarily learning about USDA and what it does and the Farm Bill. So just putting that out there, um, looking for government jobs is definitely up this alley. Okay, um, this is a question for Crystal on work-life balance, but I'm actually pretty interested in hearing it from everyone. Um, what is your work-life balance like? And uh, have you all been flexible to work remotely? How, has th how have things been working out in COVID versus like if it wasn't COVID? Um, so work-life balance, there's a ton of flexibility offered at Ocean Spray. So um, right now we're working, oh, we're remote, but it's a hybrid. So it's a volu voluntary hybrid. So we're free to go into the office and work as and when we like. Um, I personally go in a couple of times a week just to change up the scenery um, and, but it's totally voluntary for now. Um, work-life balance, I think my, my team, my managers are very understanding. So if you need to do something during the day, um, yeah, no, just, we're, they're very understanding about that. So I haven't had any issues um, in that regard so far. I can go next. Um, definitely with the work-life balance, I was going into the office every single day before the pandemic, uh, and there wasn't too much flexibility on working from home. But ever since the pandemic, and I think maybe this is one of the benefits, I know it's, it's definitely been a difficult journey, but um, one of the benefits is just companies, you know, reevaluating what it means to work from home, uh, flexibility, and uh, flexibility of hours. And a lot of people that I work with have moved to different states and we've been able to manage that. And so I think we're also seeing people are still productive, even more productive working from home. Um, and so currently we have the option of going into the office, uh, but we try to pick a day once a week for everyone to meet. Um, so I think that's always really nice. As Crystal said, change of um, having like team lunches and also we try and do you know coffee hours every week um, to kind of connect with the team on a different level than just you know straight logistics day to day yeah I mean I'm happy to chime in um my company is fully remote and has always been fully remote, which was a big draw for me wanting to work there. Um, so I we have a lot of flexibility. Um, and as far as Stony Field and our parent company, um, they were going to be doing a hybrid work environment, um, which I think works really, really nicely for a lot of people. Um, but they were requiring at least a few days back in the office. They were not flexible on that. Andigo has been very flexible. We have a hybrid um, policy, although we do have some people who are lab-based um, or field-based that have more geographic restrictions. Um, but for my role, I could work anywhere reasonable. And work-life balance, I think, at times is good, but need to create boundaries. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> okay, so this is a question for Alyssa. Uh, 
just out of interest, do you get clients buying avocado for skin nutrition or products? So maybe avocado oil and products, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure people buy it for their own uses for skin or other, um, you know, products. Uh, currently, we don't have a partnership with any companies to create a different product. I think we've talked to one about the possibility of doing avocado oil. It's just really expensive to uh, of a process. And so it's a little bit difficult to, you know, get the price as low as they need to make it worth it to make the avocado oil in order for, you know, the margin to make sense for the producers, for us, and also at the, the customer level. Um, but yeah, we're always looking for different products that we can partner with. We also sell bananas and um, one product that they sell is banana puree. Um, one of the customers is Ben and Jerry's using it for their, I think it's chunky monkey <laughs> ice cream for the bananas. Um, I think this might end up being one of our last questions. Uh, someone in the chat is wondering if the incorporation of nutritionists in food industry would be a way to change the offer of some products, for example, up products. I think I'm not sure what up means in this circumstance. UP is capitalized. Let's see who wrote this. Um, Isabel, if you want to add on to that, feel free to chime in. If I didn't give your question justice. I think um, like if there could be, you know, from our perspective at Indigo, if those types of benefits like from regenerative grain, for example, can be measured and quantified, um, there's potentially additional revenue streams there. You know, I think there's some research that shows potentially like organic grain or organic dairy has different nutritional value. Um, but I think there's, in my opinion, more work that needs to be done to quantify those gains, um, and then, you know, find a, a willing marketplace to pay a premium, um, for grain or other agricultural products with those qualities. Um, she, UP means ultra processed. I did not know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we actually have a student with our hand raised, uh, Helen, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thank you so much for the talk so far. Um, also, my question is, um, has any one of you uh, transitioned into the food industry without prior background uh, in business or um, industry? Um, and if so, like, what's the experience like? For example, what kind of backgrounds or skills have you found uh, really useful? And that could also be a question, even if with you you didn't have to go through the transition um but and also like for those who did make a transition um have you found yeah how do you find the transition uh do you have to like negotiate the different values between yourself and the uh, work Thank you. i'm happy to speak to that um for my brain so i did not have any experience at a business before starting at Stonyfield. Um, I was fortunate to get to intern there over a summer and get a little bit of a taste of what the corporate culture was like and um, get exposed to different departments during that internship. Um, but then when I started on in procurement and sourcing, it was candidly a real crash course in sourcing and working at a business. Um, there was a big learning curve. And I was fortunate that I had already established a really strong um, mentorship relationship with my boss, who was really helpful in helping me navigate learning that and learning all the different, um, you know, how the different business units and um, functions and departments interplay and work together to bring products to market. It's actually, I loved that about working at a company. I think Crystal, you've mentioned this. I think it's just such a cool process to be part of bringing product to market and kind of this huge teamwork environment, basically. Um, but it's definitely, you know, different. Everyone is working towards the shared goal of, um, you know, company revenues and bringing products to market and minimizing waste and making sure supply chains aren't disrupted. And so kind of a different set of shared goals than if you're working for a nonprofit or for government or something like that. So there's an adjustment there skills that were useful for me that I use 
still every day are negotiation skills, especially in a procurement and a sourcing role. I rely on negotiation in small ways and in big ways every single day. And so I would suggest if there's any opportunities to take like courses or, any, you know, if that's something that you want to build out, um, I find those skills really useful. And then just um, learning how to kind of present in a business environment. Things are not as much research-based, right? People want to know what are the takeaways? What do I have to know? What is the decision? What's your recommendation? And let's move forward. That's at least my experience, as opposed to me wanting to present all of the research detail and all of the background coming from kind of that um, science background. So that was a bit of a learning curve of how to present information in a way that people are going to receive um, in a way that's abstraction. Yeah, I can add to that as well. Uh, for myself, I, I moved from the public or well, government sector to private sector. This is my first role in the private sector. And I would just say, um, don't underestimate the value of the skills that you've picked up in your previous roles, even though maybe have may have been in a different sector. Because roles, um, skills such as communication, um, your analytical skills, these are still highly valued and very useful for for any role in the private sector. The structure might be a bit less bureaucratic, um, but you know these you still have to get. Uh, your work done and to add value to your work. I think how you communicate with different stakeholders, even though they're a different set of stakeholders, that's still very important. And these are still skills that you would have honed in jobs in different sectors. So not to worry too much about the transition, but think about the skills that you're bringing to the new job. I would agree with um, what Natalie and Crystal have shared and add. You know, for me, I've worked in agriculture and food my whole life, but it made a big transition. You know, previously before Friedman, um, I was managing an organic vegetable farm. So transitioning into a company that's 800, 1,000 people at Indigo um, in the private sector was quite significant um, and I think a bit of a pivot. So, you know, similar to what they have said already, like developing communication skills, I think like being able to communicate through slides uh, and being able to communicate through email effectively, um, I think are really paramount in my current role. Um, I am lucky at Indigo, like it's a very science-driven research-based organization, um, but translating research and R&D work into how that drives business value, um, I think is something that you know, we didn't talk about at Friedman and coursework um, and as a skill that I've had to develop in my time at Indigo. Yeah, I would definitely agree with everything that's been said. Um, I definitely didn't have a formal, you know, experience in supply chain. And so I really appreciated the, the lengthy, you know, training process that we went through in the beginning of the job. Um, I think a lot of the skills, you know, through Friedman, and then I worked a lot in the nonprofit world. Um, and so it's definitely a different vibe uh, working for, you know, a for-profit company, uh, different, you know, same kind of values, but, um, and goals, but different, you know, outcomes and clientele. Uh, but I think a lot of the skills, as everyone said, can be transferable. The negotiation skills, as Natalie mentioned, definitely, um, is something that I developed through this job, you know, negotiating pricing with producers and customers on both ends and trying to find, you know, a happy medium between the two and um, communicating analysis, um, kind of, you know, visualization of that and how to communicate that with producers um, is definitely different from how, you know, I would communicate, you know, end of season analysis to my customers, um, especially doing it in a different language as well. So, um, the way that you communicate, you know, research and analysis is something that you can develop over time um, and the confidence to negotiate and communicate uh, is something you learn on the job. So definitely don't be afraid to go for the jobs that you don't see all of your skills, but you know that those skills can be transferable. Yeah, I would just say I think Friedman is super, super well positioned to play a role in the private sector if that's something that you're interested in. Like we 
we're very well positioned for it and um, we have the skill set to learn fast. I think having the research background and the system thinking is a real strength. So we're coming up on time and I wanna be respectful and make sure we end at five o'clock. I just want to thank all of our panelists so much for participating today, for sharing all of this information. Um, it was very useful to me. I'm sure it was useful also to everyone else on this call. Um, I think that your LinkedIn's are on the webpage for the conference. So I'm sure you might be getting some messages soon on LinkedIn, um, maybe asking any follow-up questions, but thank you all again. I really appreciate it. And everyone have a good evening. Thanks everyone. And thanks, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. It's lovely chatting. <laughs>